Okay, my friends, very exciting new research just came out today. Toxic fungus could be contributing to some people's irritable bowel disease. I, irritable bowel. Now, this is this Candidus albicans yeast. It is normally there, but normally doesn't hurt you. However, people that have, have weak immune systems, they can get invaded. And it, it can damage and go right into you and make all kinds of toxins in your body. And then you get sick as hell. And here's the key. Um, neutrophils, which are white blood cells. They're the good blood cells that, that attack bad things are often more abundant in people with active IBD. That's because they're being attacked. That's why they're more abundant, because they're, these are the troops that are attacking the stuff that's trying to attack you. The new results suggest their presence could be tied to a rise in these fungal toxins. Well, obviously, because these are the white blood cells and the ones that kill these toxins. When researchers blocked the cytokine signaling pathway that kicks these these neutrophils into action in mouse mouth, it reduced overall colon inflammation. So they blocked the cytokine signaling pathway and it reduced the inflammation for those things. Well, I don't know how they blocked the pathway, but I imagine they put in some kind of enzyme. And the enzyme they put in, I imagine, would have been created by the bacteria that's supposed to live in these highways and stop this, these cytokine storms naturally. So whatever they put in there, the researchers blocked the cytokine signaling. Now, how did they block it? Okay, what you're seeing here is a membrane. And the membrane has to be able to pass things in and out because it's trying to keep this layer underneath protected. This layer here, as I will show you, is loaded with little pockets. But there's these tunnels through here that say, you can come in here good stuff and you can go out here bad stuff. And, and there's a little squiggly things here and there that do whatever they do. Well, I, I can't tell you exactly, but I do know that they have to have these channels to let the proteins in and out to service the tissue underneath. And the tissue underneath is the interstitial. Let's take a look at it. Don't forget, it's going to be this layer right here. Now that membrane I showed you was what they used to consider these membranes. Well, they're a little different than they considered them before. They have this webbing in them, which is interstitial. And they knew that this was sort of in there, but they didn't really give it any real major importance other than to be as flexible and it can your skin and your organs. Because this, this stuff coats, membranes coat every single different type of tissue in your body. Women's breast tissue, men's breast tissue too, has a certain type of membrane that has a certain type of bacteria that live in there. That's why if a woman gets breast cancer, sometimes they suspect the other one could very well get breast cancer as well because it's, it's the same bacteria because it's the same tissue. You have this tissue on your kidneys. You have my, lymph nodes have tissue that's in the lymph nodes. You may get cancer on your back and then you get cancer in your kidneys uh, for wherever the lymph nodes are. It depends because it's the same bacteria that live there. And if it's dead in one area, it's more than likely weak or dead in most areas that have that same tissue, that same bacteria. Now, what does that bacteria do that may be weak? And if it's weak, you're in trouble. And there's always good and bad. There's always good and bad. There's good and bad, good and bad, good and bad forever. So you have to keep the bad not invasive enough to overwhelm the good. And the bad actually does help you. They found out that the bad bacteria is good for you. <laughs> but it's only in certain quantities. It creates certain responses of, of your body that are good for you. But when they overwhelm your good bacteria, then it's all over. Then you got a problem because your good bacteria just was either killed or dead or whatever. The good bacteria will always win if there's enough. Now, in this new COVID problem, that invasion 
we don't have any bacteria that understands what to do. That's the problem. We, we have to train our bacteria. It's like, it's like the b bacteria goes to the lab to figure out what to do to make a chemistry to attack that stuff. And that is exactly what happens in your immune system. Exactly. Your body doesn't do anything. The bacteria is the, is the chemist. Your bacteria is the, the doctor. It's the analyst, it's the lab specialist, it's the, it's the manufacturer of these new defensive systems, which are new bacteria, And then they go and populate in along with all the rest of the bacteria. You have new bacteria, and you have new programs that say, hey, if we see this chemistry out here trying to bite in and come in through here, send out, first of all, send out mucus. See mucus? If it gets through that, send out the talk to the guys that know the chemistry so they'll, they'll make the chemistry set and that'll go out and kill them. And you get inflamed here. You'll be sick, absolutely. No question whatsoever because you're creating toxic chemistry and that attacks the toxic chemistry trying to attack you. It's a fight. You've got a battle going on in your wherever it is and one of them's going to win. And you better hope it's the good one in this COVID case. And what does it do? They attack the tissues in here. In the COVID, it's attacking these brown springy parts so that the bags don't open back up again. And your blood vessels and your heart and your lungs can't do this because the springy stuff doesn't have the springs left in it. And, you, and then they have to intubate you with air and do all kinds of things to try to keep you pumped up. So that you, Anyway, this is your immune system right here now. It's, it's, it's becoming very well understood. This is absolutely critical to your health. I showed you the other membrane. It had a top and a bottom. Well, that's like this. In between there, that's a barrier between the bad stuff that's out there and the good stuff that's down here. This is where your body lives. Out there is where you're touching the rest of the world, if it's skin or if it's in your, your um, digestive system. Well, the poop is going down through there. And you want some of that poop to come in? Yes, absolutely. You're going to send chemistry out, which is called enzymes and catalysts, to break down those products, those carrots and peas and corn and whatever else you're eating. And if you don't have the enzymes to break it down, you get bloating and gas and diarrhea and constipation. So a lot of people say, well, I can't eat anything with a lot of fats in it. Well, there's it's supposed to be chemistry in here that goes out and says, hey, this fat, the guy's got some fats coming down. Go and break it out. We can use some of that stuff. Well, you don't have the guys to do it. It, it festers in there, and then, then you have problems in your gut. That's what irritable bowel syndrome is. You don't have the bacteria to do the job. And then you can get invaded because your tissues here are not protected because you don't have the bacteria to protect your tissues. Now you get invaded. Now you get sick, and then... Then it's all over in, in a lot of cases, especially when it's so invasive that you there's nothing you can do about it. That's called pre-existing conditions. And then when you get a massive infection in a person that has no boundary layers, they have no bacteria in there to stop the invasion, and you get a, a hit with a serious, you know, intruder. <laughs> Case is closed. All right, they go on to say that compared to the microbiota, which is the bacteria that lives in your gut, but they don't realize that bacteria also lives in the membranes and throughout your entire body in these um, interstitial fluid-filled bags. I, I, I'm, I'm saying they don't understand. I don't think they understand exactly because the, all this bacteria in your body produced in your gut, yes, but it goes through this fascia, uh, all through the fascia and this fluid-filled highway to go to the membranes that need that bacteria to protect them by creating mucus, first of all, which is the first line of defense, is slime. Every membrane has the ability to create slime. Secondly, the bacteria that lives in there has the ability to create enzymes and catalyst. An enzyme is a, a, a extremely sophisticated chemistry set and it works on things to protect you or it may go out and break down food so that you can ingest the food. These are the kind of things that bacteria does in your body. There's literally nothing 
that happens in your body that doesn't involve bacteria. Not a single thing. If you think about it, there's not a single thing that can happen just by accident. These chemicals have to be broken down in such unbelievably sophisticated ways. It's just incredible. An, an enzyme, the one molecule in an enzyme can attack a million other molecules that it wants to break down in one second and break them down. Brrr, done. And, and that single molecule goes on and it doesn't even get broken down itself. It's like a spark. It sets off reactions. Those reactions end up creating a product. That product is a molecule. That molecule is needed by your body. They're missing a, a lot of the ways that there's so many electrons in electron flood theory, which is something that's not understood, electron flood theory, because protons are not one big gigantic proton. Protons are 1,839 or so electrons, and those electrons can migrate all around and do all kinds of things. So we can make chemistry sets that are just so sophisticated they have no idea yet. I'm just telling you, that's a fact. If you, once you get into electron flood theory and you understand that everything there is is made of electrons, and a proton, a proton is 1,839 of those in a ball. It's nothing more than a ball of electrons, but they're dipoles. And because of the nature of these particles, the number of things that can be done with them is just staggering. To use just what he is here on the on the periodic chart to 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 support life and to create life is not it's not real. It's just not possible. There's just not enough combinations of things here. You know, at the at the very end, yes, when you make all these particles fit together, chemistry is right. I have no problem with chemistry, but getting to these particles, they say all of these things were made during the Big Bang. I say that's not right at all. These things can be literally manufactured by bacteria. They can take some of this and make it into some of that if they want. If the enzymes and the catalysts are correct, they can break these things down because these are the particles that make them. They're not just one big glob. Oof, oof, oof. They go, blip, blip, blip. this is how it works. And bacteria go, to blip, blip, blip. and they make whatever they want. This is not all from the Big Bang, which is, you know, kind of ridiculous in the first place. I don't know how it all got here, but I, you know, conceptually, it doesn't make any sense to me whatsoever that everything came from nothing, and then it all fit together perfectly, and then life just popped out of it. And then it's it, it, from one little tiny bit of something that started gyrating at all, the whole, all life came from that. That's just, it's insane. Literally insane. And now with all the research I've done on mud fossils and on the physics, literally all of science is insane. At this point, it's just nothing works. Not a single thing works anymore. Zero. Geology is 100% wrong. If they don't understand that everything's made out of dipole of electrons, how could you possibly be right about anything? The Hubble's not right. Space is filled with electrons because they are coming out of the sun of every luminous body. They're all over. They're dust, and they know that's the solar wind. So how could light not be slowing down? I could show you it accelerates. It slows down. I've shown it over and over and over. So we're living in a, a fantasy world right now. <laughs> just, that's all I could tell you. Until we start to do the Mud Fossil University research and let it become open and not sequestered as it's been. Let them walk around in circles just doing what they do. And, and, and that's, I would be upset if I was a student knowing that this is something that should be understood and has been really tried to be forced on the people that should understand it and been rejected and told to be quiet. That's not the way I understood science was supposed to work. But I have understood that that is the way it works. That's exactly the way it works. You speak up, you're in trouble. you got to stay on the page or get off the stage. All right, I, I just be careful. Don't get confused. These are neutrophils. I always talk to you about nucleophiles. 
two different things. Neutrophils are your white blood cells. Nucleophiles are the invading species that make stones turn into, I mean, uh, fleshy tissues turn into stone. And they, they invade. They're invaders. So that's the two. Don't get confused. I, mean, I just want to make sure you, because I'm always talking about nucleophilic substitution, strictly related to mud fossils. Nu neutrophils. See, it's got a T. Neutrophils are white blood cells. Okay, Kabish.